Uh, our topic today is, is transhumanism and, and faith. Um, and so, uh, before we begin, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Loving Father, Lord, as we uh, consider this topic of uh, transhumanism, I pray, Lord, that uh, you would um, help us, Lord, to understand some of the uh, winds of doctrine that are blind and, and some of the challenges that we will be facing. I pray, Lord, that you would give us uh, insight, um, but that we would look at these things from from your perspective, Lord, and that we would uh, um, be prepared, Lord, to respond to perhaps some people that we might have come in contact with who believe this uh, concept, that we might be a, a light and witness to them. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Okay. okay, let's uh, just uh, have a show of hands. Uh, how many of you here have ever even heard of transhumanism? Can you raise your hands? So, like, maybe, um, <laughs> maybe five percent. Okay. <laughs> then this is going to be. Uh, well, I'm no expert uh, in transhumanism, but I obviously, it's, it's, I think we're going to learn a lot here today. Um, so, playing God, transhumanism, and faith. Could you turn on the little, little lights, the small lights, footlights? Foot lights. Um, is it here? Yeah. It's the far. Yeah, there we go. Is that helpful? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let me just uh, show you where we're going. Uh, first, I'll go ahead and give a, a definition of what transhumanism is, uh, and then um, look at different aspects of it, including physical enhancement, genetic modifications, mental enhancement, life extension, and then some of the existential risk uh, associated with them. And then we'll look at, you know, what where does this concept come from? Where does it fit within the, within the world of philosophy? And then I'll conclude by uh, the Christian perspective or, or my perspective on uh, the, the significance of these things. So let's begin with the definition since most of you have not heard of this before. Um, and, and quite frankly, most people in the United States have never heard of this before. It's sort of a, it's sort of a little niche, but I think it is, uh, it's important for us to know about. So the definition of transhumanism, or sometimes they abbreviate as H plus, or humanity plus, or transcending humanity. It's an international cultural and intellectual movement with an eventual goal of fundamentally transforming the human condition by developing and making widely available technologies to greatly enhance human intellectual, physical, and psychological capacities. So in a nutshell, it's basically saying what is the maximum we can do with technology in terms of incorporating it within us to be able to make us sort of superhumans, to go beyond what we would normally consider to be uh, humans. And, and I would say that uh, people who consider them transhum themselves transhumanists, not all of them, but, but the large majority of them think that not only is this the destiny of humanity, but they think that this is a desirable destiny. It's something transhumanists want us to go beyond our physical and mental human limitations. They want us to become, you know, sort of like, uh, like little g-gods. So this is, uh, this concept of transhumanism, it's, it's slowly becoming more and more well-known uh, in, in magazines and things like this, including the sort of popular, the popular press. Um, but I predict that should time last, that in fact this is going to become sort of generally known and it become, it's going to become a, a larger and larger factor as our tech, technological abilities uh, improve. So let's just take the example of the eye to show you sort of the, the stages of, of which we become uh, sort of more and more um, or, or more beyond human. So let's just take eyes, you know, I've got these, you know, I've worn these glasses for years. So am I enhanced because I wear glasses? And mm -hmm. the answer is not Same really. I'm, I'm getting back up to, <laughs> you know, to normal, you know. Um, and so am I still human, uh, although I wear glasses? And the answer is yes. You know, I, I don't think anybody really debates that. Um, but what about this? Have you guys heard of Google Glass? Okay, this is this is this is enhancement. This is uh, uh, it's it's worn. It looks uh, rather geeky, 
Um, but it uh, basically it puts a computer in your eye, and because it's part of a clear glass, you can begin to mix um, mix uh, reality that you're seeing with with what the computer generates. And so, say for example, if you're wearing it, this is what you might see if you're walking along and you uh, come to a subway, and just as before you're going down, lo and behold, your computer knows your location, recognizes that you're going to be going down into the subway. And so in your vision pops up this little thing that says subway service suspended, do you want to walk, do you want to take a bus, you know, and I don't know if it's winking or something like this, you can select things on the screen and you can interact with the computer. So that's beginning to blur reality with virtual reality. Um, well, you know, they are seriously looking at can we actually put this into a contact lens and so you don't even have to wear this geeky looking pair of glasses, you can have, you know, artificial reality integrated with, with, your, with your regular reality. Um, and of course, the ultimate thing would be sort of a retinal implant. And of course, um, for people with certain medical conditions, in fact, they are looking at doing retinal implants and being able to, uh, to uh, mix sort of a camera vision in your retina with, with uh, digital information as well. <clears throat> okay, well, what about uh, physical enhancement? Um, uh, there's a, a lot of different ways in which we can enhance our, our, our physical abilities. Uh, certainly the military is quite interested in, in developing uh, robotics, uh, sort of prosthesis, but that are motorized, um, so that uh, our soldiers are able to carry heavy loads without becoming fatigued. Uh, so on the left, you know, is this person uh, still human? I would say by all means. What about this on the right? You can still insert somebody there, but it's beginning to look more and more like Terminator. <laughs> and so the question is, is, you know, how much of our body can we replace and still be considered humans? You know, if you have a hip replacement, knee replacement, sure. But what if that's motorized and you're able to leap over tall buildings in a single bound? Well, you, <laughs> you begin to wonder. Um, this, this is actually a, 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 full, a full robot, uh, and yet it maintains a balance, it, it walks, uh, it can pick up things, uh, and so the question is as well, if somebody um, loses a leg or an arm, could it be replaced with a robotic one? And the answer is yes, they're certainly working on that. Um, but at what extent do we say, oh man, I'm getting old, my body's getting old, let me just get one of those you know, replacement bodies and you, you go to eBay, you buy one, you use one because it's inexpensive or something. Um, and so uh, physical enhancement is part of what uh, transhumanists are looking at. Certainly genetic modification. Um, and th this is one that I sort of uh, struggle with a bit uh, as to what's, what's appropriate and what's not. Um, and this is a medical condition. Anybody know what this is called? Progeria. Okay, okay, progeria, exactly. And of course it's it's um, you know a genetic defect in which uh, children age. Now I'm a physician, um, and so I, I work to you know all the time to sort of overcome uh, physical mental problems. Um, so would I support the idea of genetic engineering to treat or prevent uh, or even eliminate from the population things that we? readily recognizes genetic diseases. How many of you would feel comfortable with genetic modification for genetic diseases? Okay, it looks like the majority of you. I would, um, but uh, there's like this movie called Gattaca in which uh, in, it's imagined in the future in which people are sort of selected um, uh, to uh, where people are not having natural children, most are not having natural children, but instead, everybody's being sort of selected for, for certain genetic, physical characteristics, and if you don't have the good set of genes, then you're sort of a second-class citizen uh, within society. Um, so that's selection. But we go beyond that, we do genetic modification. Um, now this is, um, this is uh, rats, I presume, or mice, uh, that uh, the one on the right has been genetically modified to insert a, um, I forget, it's a, it's a fluorescent gene, uh, and then when you put it under ultralight, it, uh, it glows. And so you can see that through specific genetic modification within the gene line, within the, uh, 
uh, the A um, that we're able to go ahead and change. Now the question is, is how far can we go uh, with this? Um, can we uh, can we actually um, genetically modify children to have feathers instead of hair? Wouldn't that be sort of cool to have a kid with feathers? Yeah, are they? Well, is the kid human anymore? Ninety-five percent, but you can see where where this is going. You know, and I think it makes a lot of people uncomfortable. But transhumanists sort of look at this and say, you know, why not? Why not give people the freedom to to change themselves if they want to? You know. Okay, and this is like going scarily far, and that is where we eliminate the need for humans and actually do um, uh, ectogenesis. Uh, this is actually uh, growing children in artificial wombs, and whereas this is an artist's rendition, uh, they have actually, using stem cells, have actually produced um, artificial uh, rat wombs and have carried uh, rat pups to the equivalent of our 31 weeks estimated gestational age. Uh, there was there were some problems, uh, so they didn't survive, but. It seems though probably uh, in the future technology will advance to the point where this will actually become an option. How, how far could this go? Can you start mixing animal and, and human uh, and human uh, genes? Can can you uh, can, can, you know I don't know. Is it, is it actually technically possible to have a human brain in, in an animal to where they're actually you know communicating? They understand just like we understand. Uh, and then what rights do they have? I mean, when you start mixing the species, it gets really confusing. Uh, and you know, I think that uh, we, can, we can think about what Spirit Prophecy said about um, the mixing, amalgamation. the amalgamation of man and beast. Now, was it genetic engineering like this? I mean, it looks like it could be a possibility, but you know, I don't know that we know for sure. Or really fundamentally, uh, this is actually a picture of um, Mycoplasma laboratorium, uh, which is um, a fellow named Craig Venter has actually uh, taken a sequence of one of the simplest bacteria that sort of weeded out some stuff and uh, produced a, uh, a genome uh, and put it in. These things actually sort of replicated uh, and, and divided. And I think that this is actually an image of that. And so we could begin to really fundamentally start start playing with with. Um, with organisms at the very fundamental genetic level. Uh, this is another um, aspect, nanotechnology, uh, and it's sort of, sort of like this, um, and that is really at the very molecular level, being able to actually start producing gears and power systems and conveyor belts and all sorts of things like that, uh, even to the extent of having really a desktop uh, printer, sort of 3D printer at the molecular level. Uh, which you have, you know, your elements coming in, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, other elements coming in, and then within, within the machine actually producing a very fundamental things. And so we're getting to the point where we're having really control over just the, the molecular level. Uh, it's probably going to take a while, and there's some really significant uh, technological challenges, but probably with time and the direction that we're headed, we'll be able to do this. Now, how does this fit in with, uh, with transhumanism? Well, just, just uh, let me hit the pause button as we, as we get into mental enhancement. So um, we, we spoke about physical enhancements, uh, mental en enhancement. Um, well, I can't find my cell phone, but you guys are probably familiar with, uh, with Siri. Um, and Siri is now in our hands, and you can press a button and you can ask a question uh, or request something, and Siri is getting more and more intelligent uh, to where I can say, um, literally, I can say, you know, how hot is it? And it's smart enough to know that I'm asking the temperature locally, and so it will tell me. Or I can ask uh, for all sorts of information, uh, and it just gives it back to me. Now, that's available <clears throat> to us now, um, but what if, uh, what if we had um, a brain implant, which we could think these thoughts, and Siri starts responding. So we have sort of the internet uh, available to our minds. Now this is sort of becoming, 
in the direction of sort of om omniscience, uh, where we just become more and more intelligent uh, because of the technology that we're incorporating uh, with ourselves. Um, now there's, uh, there is um, uh, work, a lot of work being done to take a look at how, does, how do our brains function at the, uh, at the neuronal level. And so they're doing these real thin, very thin uh, brain slices and then imaging it uh, to, to create what's called the connectome. Uh, and this is uh, actually seeing how neurons connect with each other. And then when the computer figures out <clears throat> which neurons are connected with which, uh, then that data set could be used to program a, um, a circuits uh, so that we could actually replicate the function of the brain in, a, in, a, in, in circuitry in, in silicon. Uh, and so there's specific efforts uh, being done to create an artificial intelligence by uh, trying to understand our brain and trying to replicate that on the, uh, on the silicon or, or computer level. So this uh, transhumanist will uh, describe uh, sort of the desire to upload your, your mind. Uh, to where your memories, your, uh, your, just the way your brain works could be converted into a file and then uploaded to a computer and backed up. So if you die, you could just reload and you feel like the, you know, into an artificial brain, an artificial body. Uh, and this is part of what they're wanting to do to pursue immortality. Now, there's, um, there's this thing um, called the technologic uh, singularity. Uh, and the idea is that with our intelligence, we're able to create technology. But if the technology is a form of intelligence, then that intelligence could come in, uh, it could come back and affect its own technology. It could enhance its own brain. And when you have a brain that enhances itself, then it can start to go exponential in terms of its, its uh, intelligence. And so the idea is that it would just go to a, to a singularity, it would just go almost like infinite. Um, and uh, this, is, um, this is a strange business uh, because uh, some transhumanists will, are, are concerned about this possibility uh, and others think that this is the next step of evolution and they think that this is uh, where uh, we should go. I should note that um, in practically all these technologies, uh, we are we're proceeding. Uh, it's, we're making real progress, uh, and it seems to me, though, if time should last, that in fact we're going to be seeing uh, this sort of stuff. You know, I don't want to minimize. There's a lot of technical challenges, but I, I'm not sure that there's anything fundamentally that would, would that would keep us from this. So, life extension. Um, literally, uh, transhumanists are are wanting to achieve immortality, which to them means living year after year after year after year and not die, okay? And they're, they're serious about this. Um, cryonics is a field uh, in which you can pay certain companies to um, sort of be on their plan. And then when, uh, when you are in the ER, it looks like you're about to die, then uh, your, you or your family can go ahead and call the company. And the company has a team standing by and they rush and they wait until you die, and then they have procedure uh, to sort of freeze you uh, and quick get you to facility, and then and they pump you with a certain sort of um, solution that that preserves your body structures even though you're frozen at uh, at um, uh, cryogenic temperatures. Are you frozen before or after death? <clears throat> after death, legally, I think it has to be after death. And and I mean, it's just. It gets really bizarre to where if you don't want the full plan, you can go with a cheaper plan in which they actually cut your head and they say just your head because they figure you know that's the core part of your body. I, I mean, it's just weird stuff. <laughs> this, I mean, it's weird. It gets really weird. So here's actually a picture. There's you know people in their containers waiting to be resurrected at some point in the future when technology is able to you know fix their disease and, and resurrect them. So um, this guy, um, Kurzweil, um, he uh, is one of the early and, and leading thinkers in the area of the singularity, the intelligence going to exp exponential growth. 
Uh, and he's also very much into um, immortality. And so this guy, um, in interviews, he says with a straight face, he says, I believe I'm not ever going to die. He says, I'm keeping healthy. And he predicts that by 1929, the, the, uh, the uh, computers are going to reach a point to which a computer will have the, uh, the uh, capacity, uh, the processing capacity of the human brain. And so he thinks that he's going to survive long enough to be one of those people that will be able to, uh, to be able to live long enough to have medical uh, enhancements to allow you to live just a little bit longer more, and then the technology will eventually take over and then, and then you live forever. So, Rick as well, 1948 to never. He doesn't plan on dying. And I think from a Christian perspective, I think there, there's a fundamental misunderstanding of, of what immortality means. Now, let me just mention the existential risk. By existential, I mean the potential of human life being destroyed. So just everybody dying. Uh, because these technologies are, I mean, just almost all of them are extremely powerful. Um, and so, say for example, in the area of robotics, could you imagine somebody producing really cheap, in the millions or billions of copies of little things that fly around and land and do all sorts of horrible stuff? You know, whatever military is behind in this technology is might be the little military that gets wiped down. So there's an incentive for militaries to to pursue this sort of stuff. Um, the I think it's it, I would hope it's obvious a, a technological singularity in which intelligent you know some computer is becoming exponentially intelligent could pose a real challenge to to the human species. Uh, there's I forget who it was, but somebody said that. Uh, these, the singularity or, or the AI, the artificial intelligence, it doesn't love you, it doesn't hate you, it just wants your, your molecules to put to another purpose. Uh, and if you think about um, what a computer program desires, maybe it desires to calculate the last decimal point of pi, uh, and it's programmed to pursue that goal. And so it finds out, oh, if I get more power, I can pursue it more quickly or if I get more computing power, so let me take over the internet and turn that to my purposes, and then if I make more computers out of matter, I can you know, go further in my calculations, and people are just matter, matter to it. Um, so we, we are, right now, we are seriously poking around in, in the biotech space. Um, there's, I've, I've seen an article on the internet in which uh, it is, um, uh, people up in, I think, Sweden, researchers have actually figured out what are the genetic changes that need to change in influenza to be able to get it to transmit uh, from person to person through you know, res respiratory transmission. Uh, and, then they, and then they publish this in the open you know, peer-reviewed literature, and you can actually see the specific genes that are needed to modify that. So we are, in the area of biotechnology, I mean, there have been some anthrax attacks and things like that. Um, and uh, so, so we are becoming more and more capable of being able to produce these sorts of threats. And, and I truly do believe it's, it's just a matter of time before you can have a graduate student who has a device in which you copy the DNA sequence and paste it, sort of patch it together, and hit the print button, and the device next to the, you know, the computer starts sequencing that whatever that virus is, and then it's produced. And so in the future, we're going to be dependent upon the least mentally happy graduate student who has access to this technology. We're hoping that they don't feel as though, well, girls have never treated me well, so I'm going to kill myself, but I'm going to kill everybody else you know, yeah, in the meantime. And so they now have their hands on this technology that can produce very serious uh, bioweapons or um, self-replicating chemicals or, or, or artificial intelligence, things like that. Um, and I, I just don't think that um, we are ever going to, the, the, the benefits of the technology are going to cause researchers to sort of pursue this in ignoring uh, the risk. Um, so let me move on to sort of, I've sort of talked about the technology and, and uh, and where this is heading. 
but where where does the where does this um, you know, I forgive me the title's wrong I got this from a from a previous uh, presentation of the formatting um, so where does this idea come from if transhumanists uh, are are very evolutionary minded and that is they think of progress and they think well you know the beginning of life and then humans and we're becoming more and more advanced and, and then what now we need to take control of our own evolution and make turn ourselves into the next step. And so the next step is some sort of artificial human being that has extremely high powers. <clears throat> um, I'm not sure how to pronounce this guy's name. Nietzsche? Is that how it's pronounced? Nietzsche. Nietzsche. Okay. So Nietzsche is a philosopher, and he, he has this idea of the uberman, or the overman, and that is uh, sort of the philosophical goal is to become great. If you're great, you're better than if you're not so great. Um, and so this was popular uh, for a while. Uh, it's sort of the Superman sort of concept. It's, it's, it's a human, but with sort of superpowers, and is therefore great. Um, now, the, the uh, Nazis sort of took this uh, to, um, to, to an extreme, and that is, well, there must be a certain type of people, a certain ethnicity that's great. Of course, they thought it was the Aryans. And so where did this sort of philosophy lead to? It led to, well, if there's great people, then there's not so great people, and so if we want to make the world a better place, let's get rid of the, you know, the, the degenerates, and, and we'll just put them in ovens and kill them, and, and let's have our, our Nazis reproduce, and eventually we're going to take over the world, and humanity will be uplifted as a result of our implementation philosophy. And of course, it was exactly the opposite. Uh, well, so, Transhumanists um, are, it's, the question is, is, is it a religion? <laughs> and if you look at it, it sure looks like it's a religion. If you look at their images, it has very religious sort of things. And the idea is basically let's pursue the goals that are, that are promised by religion, but through technologic uh, means. Um, there, there's a lot of, their images are very sort of spiritualistic, very dark, um, and there's frequently sort of Hindu sort of stuff in which it's sort of, you know, creating this mental world that, that you're in and sort of elevating yourself, so it's sort of very uh, consistent with that. But some of it just gets, uh, you know, I just, I, you know, I sort of like, okay, I'm aware of it, but I don't want to go too deep into it because I think there's a really dark side to this whole thing. So let me um, mention about the uh, Christian perspective on, on transhumanism. Um, you know, they're trying to change the world because they don't think it's good enough. Um, but if we read in Genesis 1.31, God uh, saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening, there was morning, the sixth day. Um, so... We know that there is sin in the world, and I think it's appropriate for us to work to try to mitigate the, the effects of sin. Um, but that doesn't mean us basically playing God, where, where we're uh, trying to change ourselves and change the world to, to however we want. I think there's a, a, a real uh, blind spot uh, when it comes to transhumanists that they, that they basically think, well, if they're in charge of how their future is, then it's going to be a great future. And I think they terribly misunderstand themselves, including their own sinfulness, and, and what, what sinful people will, will, how they would change themselves and change the world. Um, relationships, if, if you look at transhumanism, it's really all about self. It's self-enhancement through, through technology. Uh, and there's not really... Um, re relationships has two people making decisions, free will decisions. Uh, and the, the problem for them is they don't have enough control. If, if there's other entities around, then uh, they can't have everything that they want. Uh, and so it's all about improving your own self. But if you have a selfish person improving themselves, trying to give themselves more power, it's naturally going to uh, lead into conflict with other people who are, you know, equally powerful or more or less powerful, but maybe have different wishes. Uh, what if, if I enhance myself, what if my wish is to control other people? Well, there goes freedom for those people. 
Um, but what, what is the Christian perspective here? Exodus 25, verse 8. God says, then have them make a sanctuary uh, for me, and I will dwell among them. He wants to be in relationship with other people. He, he is transcendent. He is extremely powerful in every way imaginable. And yet, it's not all about him. It's about relationship and a love relationship uh, with his creation. So, so very, just entirely opposite. What about immortality? Um, in 1 Timothy uh, 6, uh, it says, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which God will bring about in his own time, God the blessed, the only ruler, the king of kings, lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and might forever. Amen. Um, this is, um, it says, who alone is immortal. And, and I think transhumanists, they desire immortality, but they misunderstand what true immortality is. Eternal life is not just a quantity, there's a quality to it. And, and transhumanists completely, they don't even think about that. Um, when we have eternal life, which we can have now, um, it's not just, oh good, I get to live forever and run around on planets and do fun stuff. There is, a, there is a spiritual nature to a, in, in a, in a relationship with, with our Father in Heaven um, that has a quality, it's, it's hard to describe, but it, it is so meaningful. To be able to have eternal life but not have that relationship with God would be like an eternal hell. It would be, it, you know, if you're just selfish and living forever, I don't see how in the world you can be happy. Um, becoming like God, this is totally what transhumanism is all about. Um, and, and sometimes I will explicitly state that. Uh, Genesis 11 tells a story about Babel. And it says, the Tower of Babel, it says, But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, If as one people speak in the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. So what were these people at this time? You know, they're probably still pretty intelligent, you know, uh, being, you know, still a short while from Adam. What were they trying to do? They were trying to, um, you know, do powerful things. And, and God looked down and says, "Boy, if we give these people time, and if they're all working together, then they're going to nothing that they imagine uh, will be impossible for them." And I think that we're sort of coming back to that time, as it was in the days of Noah. So it will be in the time of the Son of Man. They, um, when you have a connected world. Although we don't speak the same language, we're, we're now connected through the internet, we're connected through publication, through science, etc., through publishing. Um, we are becoming more and more powerful. And I think that uh, although we're much slower than, than these people in terms of progress, uh, I think it is sort of an exponential sort of growth. Um, and I think there's a limit. God can't allow it to, to go to its logical extreme. I'm not sure. Uh, humanity would survive that. Um, becoming like God, who, who else had this desire? Lucifer. Mm -hmm. uh, Isaiah 14. How you are fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn, you have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens, I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly and on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. Zaphon. I will ascend to the tops of the cloud. I will make myself like the most high. This is, this is, this is the philosophy of transhumanism. And, and that's why I think that it is, um, there is a very dark force behind this movement, uh, I believe. Uh, and you, you, you see it in the images that they, you know, their artwork that they choose to do 
it's, it's there in their philosophy, and they, they will oftentimes just explicitly state that they are trying to see godlike powers. Um, but uh, that's my view now, now for yours. <laughs> yeah. I'm reminded just this last what you said of a statement by Ellen White. If if Lucifer had really wanted to be like God, he would have accepted the place that God gave him and um, continued to honor and glorify God for what he was created. So, you know, there's there's that he wants to be God. He wants to be really be above God. Which is in no way like God. We place God, yes. Yeah, we, we know from Christ coming to this earth that it was a stepping down, it's multiple steps. And so so fundamentally God is not about power, not about omniscience, mm -hmm. you know. He's about love. And love is a very giving sort of thing. And I don't think that there's life. In, in anything else, the the end result of selfishness is death. So, yeah. used to be um, you know, an app on the iPad. There was a special about bots and robots, and it's not exactly what you're talking about because what you're talking about is doing something to the body. What they're talking about is what's already being done, starting, for example, with uh, changing from horses to automobiles. Yeah, human jobs are being taken over by robots. Um, there, there is, uh, there has been a concern in the past that in factories that uh, factories will replace workers and there's going to be unemployment. Uh, and it seems as though over time that that has not happened, that there's been sort of new jobs created. Uh, but there is uh, some real concern that this time it is different because not only physically, uh, I mean there, there is robots that are so generally pro programmable. Uh, that it's sort of hard to imagine what, and, and they have like vision so that, you know, they can recognize defects of, you know, things that are going by. Um, and, and that it's just sort of like if you, if you have these really capable robots that are, that are rel relatively cheap, meaning that they don't require, you know, health insurance and they don't, uh, you know, have severance pay and these sorts of things. You know, in other words, it's not real difficult to make uh, a robot cheaper. And they can learn from each other. So there right. is a point where a robot is smart enough that it no longer needs the human programmer because they can learn from some other robot. That's learning, uh, robot learning from robot. That sounds like the basis for a really scary movie. <laughs> um, so so there's, there's real concerns about uh, unemployment. This, you know, there would be an actual technological unemployment. Um, and it's not, just the, uh, it's not just the physical jobs, it's the brain, the mental jobs as well. For example, there is um, finance and sports articles now being written by computers to where even journalists, you know, just a strictly mental job, they're able to be smart enough to produce things that look indistinguishable from what a journalist uh, would write. Yeah, there's a... Even without technology, English is everybody's second language. Uh, could you hold on just one? I'd like to see if we could capture you on the videos. Is there a way of uh, just getting the microphone in their direction? 
well, stuff we do in the chairs over. <laughs> Do I have any choice about whether I'm captured on video or not? We don't have that. Yeah, well, we lived in China for a year, and we were amazed that they were, even in 2007, developing all medical education to be in English. We were asked sometimes to um, uh, evaluate the English of the professors who were perhaps going to come over here. So even if we didn't have the technology, the world is becoming of one language. All educated people seem to know English now. And yes, I thought about that verse in Genesis. It's, it's frightening to think of how close we are to one language again. Uh, not only one language uh, being English, uh, but now there is Google Translate. Uh, and, and now you can download apps that, that I've used in the mission field quite effectively where you have them listen, and then it's basically an automated translator, uh, and they'll probably become sort of real, real-time translators uh, as well. So, yeah, language is becoming less and less a barrier every single day. Uh, I think there is a, yeah. I was just going to make a comment that, like anybody, I like uh, the progress of science. You know, that's good, great, true science is what we really need. The problem that I see is that in a simple world, the world can become a big problem. Especially when there isn't uh, someone that's acknowledged as an arbiter of our destiny. So maybe if you get to, uh, I don't know if I should go here, that's total speculation. If we get to where technology just be run by anybody starts posing problems, then maybe we need a moral authority on her that helps to control how we use this technology, right? Exactly, and that, that's probably the way we're going into. And um, one of the problems that was posed here was I was thinking, well, if the robots uh, start taking over, humans have to, have to keep one step ahead of the robots. The problem is that not everybody's going to do that, and the piece that he's asked there are ones that I would probably need to take over. Interesting. <laughs> okay, uh, right here. Um, in Gulliver's Travels, which was written, I think, in the 1700s, in the 1700s, there, a Gulliver goes and visits all these places, and we kind of hear of the one about where he went to, where the, where the lily fusion, the little people, and the great pig people. But one of the places he went to visit was an island where there was, um, a small portion of the population was genetically lived forever. They were immortal. And when he heard about it, he, he was a physician. He was very excited. He thought this was wonderful. And then he came to realize that it was a terrible curse yeah. because they aged, but they never died. And when that happened, when a child like that was born in a family, this family mourned because they were so sad for the future of what was going to happen to their child. So to me, it seems like this is like Gulliver's Travels in a different direction, but it, artificial immortality is only going to be a curse. Yeah, uh, artificial immortality is only going to be a curse. Yeah, you're right. Sir? There's been several movies about it. Do you think it's actually possible to put a, the human brain into a, into a computer? Mm -hmm. Do I actually think that uh, I do the Basically, it's the thing from immortality. You know, my body's dead, but I'll live in this machine. Right, right. Um, I think that when, when people have strokes, they lose function. So I think that there are certain functions that seem to be materially based. Uh, a, lot, a lot of functions. Um, and then there's, uh, and I don't know if somebody here can help me, there is, um, these cortical sections of the brain that, that sort of are repeated, uh, and the cortical sections are something like 90,000 neurons, and if, if they can figure out how to, it's like an association cortex that is sort of like, you know, sort of where intelligence exists or something like that. Um, they're, of course, actively pursuing that. So if, if we could actually, there's some real technological challenges to even, you know, creating a, um, you know, cat-sized brain. Um, but if we could 
get the connectome, seeing all the neurons are connected and we replicated that. The, the, that artificial brain would have some function, but I, I think it would be uh, probably seriously mentally disabled, is, is my guess, in, in the early versions. Uh, but then the question is, is there more to us than just the connections of the neurons? Um, and um, that's, that's a great question, but I, I don't know that. I don't know that we, um, it sounds like you, you have something urgent to say. Well, the thing is, some of the people who say that Darwinian evolution is not valid because it cannot explain conscience. See, we have a conscience. It seems to be more than just connecting things. You know, there's a quality there that may not be able to be replicated just on a materialistic basis. Now, you're, you are saying conscience, not consciousness. Consciousness and conscience, both. Okay. But you're, consciousness in particular, and then conscience. Okay. Uh, I understand people say that there's there's a, a real fundamental question as to how could, could actual consciousness and self-awareness be right, right. From, a, from a material thing. Right. There, there is, uh, you know, the question is whether there is this irrational, um, quantum physics involved in our in our brain processes. If there's like a, some sort of connection there, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that I know, frankly. Uh, but I, um, I I have questions as to whether uh, going from a, a, a wet brain to to a silicone brain, you know, how easy that step would be. I do have concerns about something called CAI, seed artificial intelligence, in which if you can create a computer program that selects for intelligence and maybe mutates and then selects again and has them, if selection involves combat, like the smarter one kills, you know, kills the other one, then if you start the seed and give it enough processing power uh, that it may be able to uh, increase its intelligence and where, where is the limit to that? And yet the selection could be through combat, which means it, it could be just ruthless. That can't be good, yes. Yeah, you mentioned uh, Hitler and how his way of improving humanity by killing the undesirables. Right. Now, we got more sophisticated today. He killed six million, we killed 56, seven million. If we do it before they are born, if they are not desirable, we kill them. Now, my question is, recently in the country of Kenya, there was a controversy about abortion. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, evangelicals were on the side against abortion. So they asked Adventists. And publicly, the Adventist church said, we are neutral on the issue of abortion. My question to you, can a church be neutral on moral issues? If we're neutral on abortion, how about neutral on stealing, neutral on rape, neutral on sexual abuse of children? In the go, go ahead and share, here, share with them about your book. Here's the book, my mm -hmm. second book about abortion. If you want a copy, there are two ways you can get the copy. One is free, the other you can purchase. If you want to purchase it, then pick, pick by a business card. If you want it free, just write your name and address and it will be sent to you by mail. Very well, very well. There was a hand over in this direction. You're not going to ask me a question? <laughs> oh, <laughs> can churches be neutral? Churches can, but I think the more important question is should they? Yeah, right. And no. Uh, okay, so. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think as far as switching and tell it, you know, your, your actual being, your, your essence, shall we say, you know, obviously, uh, well, I would, I would think at least um, the brain would have to be, but I, you know, you, you can copy information. But you can't copy a person. You know, you can't copy life in that sense. 
we essentially have to create life, and I don't think that's ever going to happen. Uh, whether it's a combination of, obviously we know in Genesis it was the, the breath we got, you know, we got breathed life into uh, every creature. And then also, um, uh, you know, but anyway, we, uh, there's a soul issue of the soul as well. Yeah. But I think if, if they could, um, and they could start with uh, simple brains, you know, if they, if they could transfer a brain, but I really, I, as far as, it, it may be that God has prevented that, that possibility. But as soon as the brain is disconnected, that's it. You know, you're done. I, it would take some time to, obviously, the complication of connecting a brain instantaneously would be impossible. Seems like to me, but... Um, They're not trying to create a person, though. Right? They're trying to, if they, they wanted to duplicate your brain so they can... If you die, you can have, what, was, what were you explaining? You can have your, well, have um, that brain translated into another, and you could still be living in another body. It's, that would be useful if you could, if you could like extract, extract uh, the information out of people's brain, because people reach a certain age, and there's a lot of wisdom there. And it's, it's, it's you know, death is a huge sealer of, of people that have wisdom and knowledge and they, they grow old and die. And all that's lost, you know. So I, I see value in even copying, but as far as, you know, like these people that have their head frozen, you know, thinking that they're ten, being reconnected later, good luck. Uh, well, that's actually, that could be, be a way of, of, you can't do it instantaneously, but if, if it's frozen, maybe you got a little time to let, let me just point out that it is 11.30 for any of you who need to, to leave to get to the other service. Um, but for those who want to stay around and continue that. I think the bigger concern is we're already getting a population of individuals who intellectually are incapable of holding a job in the new information age, and that population is growing. How it is they're going to sustain the world to help them keep building their better and better stuff without a social environment that destroys them because you've got to figure out how to maintain all these people. We went into the dark ages in Rome when Rome couldn't sustain what it was doing and when the barbarians took over we lost a lot of technology at that time and went into the dark ages. We're going to face a time when we have masses of people who are marginalized because their inability to intellectually hold a job or do something. There aren't any more for them and society is going to have to deal with that and that's probably going to be a real crimp in this ever evolution of intelligence and because we'll have social issues to deal with the masses. Interesting. Okay. Go ahead. Going back to being like God, it's not as simple as it seems. Adventists sing all the time, I would be like Jesus, not God. But I thought Jesus was God. But we don't want omnipotence and omniscience and those things. We're talking about some character traits, I think. Our Mormon friends, on the other hand, at least the men, will have worlds of their own and will be gods of those worlds. Uh, um, Peter says that we need to be partakers of the divine nature. So we are talking nature here. And Ellen White says a lot about that, about the necessity of becoming partakers of the divine nature. So, like God, has to be split between nature and attributes like omniscience and stuff. And, and I would say between the, uh, I don't know, the sort of the power aspects of God uh, versus his character, I, I think his character is more fundamentally to who God is. Um, God isn't, I almost hate to bring this up, but it's sort of like the United States is the most powerful nation in the world. But that's not what, that's not the only thing that makes it significant. You know, if, if uh, Russia was the most powerful, you know, had, had as much powerful as, as, as we, and we switch places, uh, the world would operate probably in a very different way because the nature is different. It's not just an issue of power, military power, for example. It has to do with principles, you know, values that you have, your, your character, these sorts of things. 
that's what really makes somebody who they are. And I think God is uh, certainly all powerful and all knowing and all these sorts of things, no doubt. But that's not the fundamental nature of God. God is love. So, is there another hand over here? Okay. Well, I tell you what, let's um, let's uh, go ahead and close right now, but if any of you want to hang around and talk about that, that'd be great.